Hi, Dr. Brooke. Thanks for joining the Western Canon podcast. Hey, hey, Jordan. It's good to be here. Excellent. So I want to start by asking you a question that I posed uh, to the philosopher Stephen Hicks um, when he was on this podcast. Stephen is an academic philosopher. He's also an objectivist. You probably know about him, sure. um, which I would argue makes Stephen an extremely rare breed in academia. Um, that is because Ayn Rand has been ostracized from the modern academy. She's not regularly discussed in philosophy programs. There are no objectivism courses being taught at any mainstream universities, or at least none that I'm aware of. Um, uh, if you do mention Ayn Rand's work in a philosophy class at a mainstream university, you get laughed at or told that you're juvenile. The common response I've heard is, well, I used to read her when I was a teenager. I don't know why. I don't know what that means. Sure. Um, sure. And I would know this because I majored in philosophy. Um, and to me, I would say that this is extremely odd. Ayn Rand's work is still widely read today. Her books fly off the shelves. Mainstream politicians and actors and titans of industry and artists credit her as being an inspiration and a genius. And um, I, you, you probably could even argue that she's the single most influential and widely read woman philosopher in history. She yep. created her own <laughs> comprehensive, internally consistent philosophical system. Everyone I've ever talked to has read at least one of her books. And so my question is, why has Ayn Rand been so unfairly maligned in modern scholarship? Why is she seen as taboo? What is it about her philosophy that, 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 that draws the ire of so many in the uh, so-called intellectual elite? Well, it's a big question. I mean, uh, so recently there was an article actually published in Aeon, I think it's Aeon magazine, which is kind of a, a, a popularized magazine for philosophers. And it was from a well-known female philosopher who said, we need to stop paying attention to Ayn Rand in academia. And she gave exactly what you just said. You know, Ayn Rand's incredibly influential. Our students read her. Um, she's, she has more impact on our students than anybody else we're going to teach. And while she then went on to badmouth Ayn Rand and to distort and pervert her philosophy, she said, we've got to start taking her seriously. So maybe, maybe, maybe academia is waking up to, to exactly this issue. I'd also say that I, I don't want to overstate it. There are some people who do teach Ayn Rand. I mean, uh, certainly there's some objectivists at some pretty prominent universities from Darrell Wright at, uh, at, at uh, Claremont Colleges, uh, Tara Smith has a chair in the philosophy of objectivism at the University of Texas in Austin, a top 20 philosophy department. And, uh, and Greg Salamieri actually teaches at Rutgers University, which is the top philosophy department in the world, at least some years, uh, depending on the survey. So we do have some presence in some top universities. I don't want to be too pessimistic about where we are. But yes, I mean, generally, she is shunned to take somebody to write in Aeon magazine. We need, a, we need to take her more seriously. And, and I, think, I think hopefully, and I think they, they, they are starting to take it more seriously. But I think the reason is she wasn't an academic, is one, right? She didn't speak their language. She didn't do philosophy based on how in the 20th century academic philosophers did it, in a particularly stylized, particularly obtuse <laughs> um, uh, way. And she wasn't part of the club and it's important to be part of the club i think uh you know for, for the philosophers for people inside the club they don't like outsiders but of course it's deeper than that i think i think the real reason although i think that's part of it the real reason is that she challenges so much of conventional philosophy and she approaches it from a completely different fresh new perspective so it's not just that the content of her philosophy is different. Her methodology is different. So her, her whole uh, approach to epistemology and as a consequence, the whole way in which we, she presents the objectivist philosophy is different. So she really is much more Greek than she is uh, modern. Um, and, but, but, but they don't know how to fit her in because okay, she's not... 2,000 years old, they can kind of tolerate that because that's old, but uh, but she doesn't pit, fit into a post-Christian, post-Kant um, era of philosophy, both because she's uh, she, because of uh, the way she presents the ideas, and then of course the content turns everything upside down, right? Um, philosophy, to some extent or another, has been dominated by some form of 
um, you know, primacy of consciousness or a rejection of reality as it is since Kant, maybe even since Descartes to some extent. Um, it, it's, it's very suspicious of reason, reason as Ayn Rand understood it. Of course, reason, Ayn Rand understands reason in a completely different way than academic philosophers talk about reason. They talk about reason as a Kantian for not kind of thing. In a sense, something happens inside your mind that is not that related to actual reality. Uh, so her understanding of reason is much more enlightenment related, but the enlightenment is kind of out, and it's not quite the enlightenment because she is more refined than the enlightenment, so it's more Aristotelian. And then, of course, in ethics, she completely overturns. She, she says there is no dichotomy between is and art, and uh, which which academics don't even know how to think about because of the way they think about reason and the way they think about reality. And then she's a rational egoist, which overturns 2,000 years of, of one way or another altruistic philosophy, altruistic ethics. And of course, ultimately, she is a, as a consequence of all that, a radical for capitalism in a world where most academics, never mind most philosophers, are, are quite left and quite suspicious suspicious of anybody who is pro-markets. I, I, I think even academic philosopher who did all the things but landed up being pro-capitalism at the end of the day, they would look suspiciously on them because politics, partially the problem is that they've convinced themselves that politics is everything. I think, I think uh, this maybe comes out of English and the postmodernism and so on, that everything is political. There's right. nothing in life that's not driven by politics and therefore... Maybe maybe the postmodernists don't quite have it, that big an effect on philosophy departments, but they have some. Certainly, personally, so many of these people can't think of philosophy separated from politics. So um, I think I think for all those reasons, and again, her methodology, which is English, right? She speaks in complete English sentences and comprehensible ones. Right, clarity. She, talks she values clarity. Respect yeah. respectful way. Nobody writes like that, right? right. Uh, in, in academic philosophy, at least. And although, you know, they do respect, they seem to respect somewhat Sartre and Camus and, and the, the existentialists who, who wrote in plain, in plain language. Uh, but I think it's because they were conventional at the end of the day. Philosophically, they weren't revolutionaries. But even the existentialists are out now. Uh, they're out. And I think a big part of that is that they talk, they talk a lot about freedom and responsibility. And so they're out. Yes, they, 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 you know, and I don't know how big they were in philosophy ever. I, I just don't know. They seem to have impacted other fields in the humanities much more than they impacted philosophy itself.